Okay, good morning and welcome to NCA's first public program of 2022, Creating Space for All, Communicating About Inclusion, Diversity, Equity and Access in Our Classrooms and on Our Campuses. I'm Lakeisha Anderson, NCA's Director of Academic and Professional Affairs, and I'll be moderating this conversation today. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with NCA or its shared language, NCA uses the acronym IDEA when referring to issues of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. So when you hear us say IDEA, we're referring to these specific and equally important issues. Today, we'll be speaking with four panelists about ways to advance communication around IDEA in our classrooms and on our campuses. With us today are Drs. Jim Cherney, Melissa Mead, Elizabeth Parks, and Marnell niles Goins. And now before we get started, I'll ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves. I start. Jim. Um, my name is Jim Cherney. I am an associate professor in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Nevada in Reno. I'm also the director of the communication core, which means that I'm, among other things, the basic course director and direct our, our uh, teaching, our graduate teaching assistants um, who are teaching our basic course. Um, my area of interest is in ableism and ableist rhetoric, and I've been involved in things like the, uh, the IDEA Council uh, now for several years, and have been long a member of the Disability Issues Caucus at NCA. Thank you. Melissa, would you mind going next? Hi, yes. Um, I'm Melissa Mead. I'm a visiting assistant professor in, in the communication department at Villanova University. Um, I've been a member of the National Communication Association for about 10 years. I've been very active in the ethnography division. Um, and my area broadly, I, re I research um, culture, identity and communication and my my um, emerging book project is about um, deindustrialization, labor and identity in the anthracite coal region. Great, thank you. Elizabeth? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Parks. I'm the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Student Services at Colorado Mountain College and an Assistant Professor of Communication Studies at Colorado State University. Um, I have served with Jim on the IDA uh, Council uh, over the last several years, and also my research and scholarship tends to focus on listening and dialogue across diversity and difference, particularly the ways that diverse individuals and cultures um, and the ways that we embody our identities Inflect, impact and inflect our ethics around some of those choices. So that's what I'm bringing to the table today. Marnell. Hi, good morning. I'm Marnell Niles Goins. I am second vice president of NCA and I am the dean of the College of Sciences and Humanities at Marymount University. Uh, I've been part of NCA for I think 20 years and um, I've served on a number of uh, uh, divisions and the caucuses and um, in my uh, areas of research are in organizational and small group communication with uh, particular attention being made to uh, gender and race. Great, thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, before we get into our questions, I want to note that there's going to be a 30 minute question and answer session at the end. So. Hold on to your questions and you'll be able to put those in the chat later. We just ask that you hold those questions until we're done uh, with the conversation. So with that, let's get into our questions. So despite not teaching courses that overtly address IDEA, there are many faculty interested in promoting IDEA in the classroom. How can these faculty start these conversations in the classroom? Melissa? Um, I, I have, um, I think this is something that is, is a complex thing to, to address kind of in, a, in an institutional, in an institutional way as, as a communication ethnographer um, who, who studies inequality in, in communities. Um, I, you know, because as you said, not everyone, you know, maybe perhaps directly directly teaches that I, I've, I have um, come to the conclusion that we have in institutions might benefit from establishing internally facing research units on campuses 
that allow colleges and universities to kind of reflect on and hold a mirror up to themselves. And I know that we already have, um, you know, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion offices, and they have been fulfilling a major function. Um, but I think with um, most colleges and universities have terrific social science faculty, terrific ethnographers who are contributing new basic knowledge on equity and inclusion. And um, I, I see this connection between research and pedagogy. And we often hear or we often talk about or there's this maybe maybe it's maybe it's a generalization that there are silos. Um, the conversation that I'm suggesting starting, however, is applying this work to institutions themselves. In other words, the research for IDEA would develop and integrate the cutting edge knowledge into our programs and our policies, even our classes. And um, they would be independent from the main um, IDEA or DEI administrative structure. And they would also have the ways or the power or the means to impart some new ideas throughout the college or the university. So that could help, I think, um, start new conversations in different kinds of classes that maybe don't have an idea or, or that don't overtly address idea. So Lakeisha, um, I'm just gonna uh, actually talk about the question itself. And I wanna say that there is not one class that um, any of us teach that does not overtly talk about idea. Uh, it could be statistics, it could be a uh, small group communication, it could be health communication. Uh, and I think it's easy to either not talk about it at all and think that there's some objective truth that applies to everyone. Or um, what, I, what I tend to say is, you know, uh, it's diversity time when it's Thanksgiving, which is, you know, first you teach what is seen as objective. Um, so white, cisgendered male, um, what is true. And then around November, at the end of the semester, in those last like two weeks before finals, we talk about, oh, and here's some other um, theorists or conversations that we can be had. And then you've done your diversity quota. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to argue against that and uh, and say that there's not one course that um, a student does not view through a race or gendered um, or sexualized lens and uh, and as faculty members that needs to be addressed in the classroom. Um, it's really easy and 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 this also benefits the university in terms of um, like retention and graduation and all those wonderful things that we're thinking about. Um, but it starts with what we're teaching in the classroom as being true and what we're teaching in the classroom as being important. Yeah, I, I want to echo that. I agree entirely, Marnell. And, and, and also note that the, you know, the access is always an issue in the classroom, regardless of what the content is. I mean, it doesn't have to be one of our classes to recognize that we benefit from uh, ways of teaching that are universally designed to allow learning for lots of different people, whether they're identified and recognized as being disabled or somebody who needs a special accommodation. There's all sorts of technologies and techniques like Zoom, for instance, that we have that provide access to a wider group of people. And it's, I think that we can run into uh, a trap and I, I'm not saying that we do necessarily, but I've seen professors who make this mistake who will say, well, you know, I teach biology. I, I, there really isn't any access issues that I need to be aware of. Um, and it's like, no, 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 <laughs> that's, that's, that's the mistake right there is thinking that somehow this isn't something you need to be aware of. Elizabeth, did you have something you wanted to add there? I see your hand is up. Yeah, I, I just completely agree. I think these conversations are always there. There's always underway. Um, I think even looking at the syllabus that you use in your classes and really attuning and attending to the voices that are represented in those spaces, mm -hmm. um, showing up for class or a meeting or anything and just like giving yourself a little bit more space at the beginning, five to 10 minutes to listen first and really see what the conversation is because I have yet to really enter a space in which IDEA um, topics, issues, frameworks, structures 
aren't actually already present. And so it's very easy actually not to uh, think about how faculty can start that conversation, but how they can further the conversation, how they can build on the conversation, how they can like loop in the conversations that are already underway. So I think of it much more um, from that context of, we don't have to start things from scratch. These conversations have been underway in the academy for centuries, millennia. Um, we just need to figure out at which entry point do we want to tackle these conversations, engage these conversations, and what's the best way to invite other people into these conversations in our classrooms and in our uh, campus context. So that's one of the ways I think about it is just using the materials we have, using the relationships we have, using the conversations that are underway um, and not necessarily starting, but just adding one more piece, changing the direction just a little bit. Great. In your opinions, what areas on campus are most in need of idea advocacy and why? For instance, um, do you feel that there's more of a need in administration pathways, in classrooms, or are there other areas where you feel like um, idea advocacy is really important right now? Lakeisha, I made a list and um, it, <laughs> they, with, from the list, I should just say all. <laughs> so, and this is, I'm saying this uh, as a dean, um, because I have realized that no matter um, what I do within academic affairs and within my college, I'm really reliant on every single other uh, unit at the university. So um, starting with like marketing, um, who are we uh, marketing to, starting continuing on with admissions, like who are we accepting at the university, um, what are the requirements for those admissions, I think about financial aid, I think about scholarships, um, like who are we offering scholarships to? I'm thinking about markers for those scholarships in terms of um, why is GPA always the most important marker and signifier of a student who has potential for success? Um, so students are eliminated um, in a lot of uh, those regards. I think about um, housing. I think about um, you know charging students for graduation. I think about the cost of books. Uh, I could go on and on. Um, so I, I can't figure out or think about a, um, a single unit. I think about who does the discipline at the university, um, who is uh, uh, suspended or expelled, or who is charged with plagiarism, or who is charged with being threatening. Um, so it's very, very difficult for me to narrow it down to one unit because it's all of them. Um, I'd like to add to that if I could. Um, I think, you know, I agree with um, her. Um, there are very many stakeholders in need of I idea, faculty, but I think uh, um, students, administrative staff, I think especially non-tenure track faculty and adjuncts, undergraduate students who come from first generation backgrounds might be um, some that really need a, a focus of that. It's significant to look where they are in their trajectory. Um, the stakeholders, as, as um, she was pointing out, hiring, promotion, recruitment, it, retention. So there's various places where these inequities can emerge. Um, when we have these uh, contingent workers where the university is full of these contingent workers, depending upon the university in which you work. Um, there's um, there, that, that is something to really consider because that is an idea issue. Yeah, I think that um, I, I'm, I agree with both of these points. I think that, that what we're seeing though is that there's uh, what Morel is pointing out is that we're dealing with something that's an institutional problem, right? These are institutional issues of, of that restrict people's ability to participate. Exclusion is something that's not just happening to you know, at the level of what students are there, or whether we're hiring uh, instructors who are in temporary positions, who we're taking advantage of because we're not providing them benefits, and so on. I mean, exclusion is happening throughout the entire system. So on one hand, it doesn't really even make sense to say what are the specific areas that we can do to fix this. You're, you're not going to ever fix it without really trying to get at the ways that this is something that infiltrates us at so many levels that we need to be thinking about it as a kind of you know, as as a kind of what we're doing here, right? As an overall conversation of how do we change the institutions? Um, but that doesn't mean that we should ignore the ways that certain groups are, I think, in, in particular, um, jeopardized by the way that these institutions have been practicing. And that privilege is a big part of this. And so recognizing the ways that privilege can also, you know, can sometimes obscure the 
um, the, the ways that these systems continue to operate is a critical first step saying, okay, we understand that this is a problem that might not seem like it's a problem because a lot of people are doing fine, but it's a problem that's throughout the entire institution. And that if we take away the, the, the way that privilege distorts that picture, then we end up, I think, seeing that pretty clearly. And Jim, I would say um, that even if one academic unit, for example, has it just down packed and wonderful, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other units need to get on board because there's going to be a point Absolutely. in time where it's going to be evident um, that the students, and I'm thinking about it from a student perspective, are going to uh, feel excluded. So even if in the classroom mm -hmm. um, they have the, the best teachers and the syllabi are uh, diverse, and um, there's going to be a point in time where they're going to have a run in with financial aid, for example, or um, you know another entity on campus. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so even if one unit has a down pack, you're right, it's institutional. And the mm -hmm. institutional has to put it as its very foundation in order for the institution and for the students to Absolutely. be successful. Absolutely. Okay. I want to focus specifically on student support for just a moment. Mm -hmm. How do demographic factors like race and income and geography impact the support that students receive on campus and in their classrooms. I can start. <laughs> so um, it's interesting that um, if you if you normally if you ask a faculty member or a department how they're doing in terms of um, diversity and in terms of how they're reacting and relating to um, their students, they think that they're doing well. Um, but then when you look at the statistics that show the students who drop out earlier on, um, it's not specific to, um, it's, I would, it's, it's not general to the entire academic uh, unit, but it's specific to every single program. And that's when the faculty members start to realize, okay, well, it's not just um, academic affairs, but it's actually my particular program. In my program, um, the lower income students are leaving the university at a higher rate or uh, students of color are leaving the university at a higher rate. Uh, so it's evident and it's personal to each department and to each college that there's something that's not happening um, that's causing students to leave. Um, and it's students of color and it's students who um, don't have as much money. Um, a lot of universities do like this thing about sense of belonging. And that's really important. You want to feel like you belong in a classroom. Um, I want to push back against that a little bit. Um, and I wanna say that sometimes it's, a lot of times it's money. Um, the books cost too much, tuition is too much, and not enough scholarships that are available to students who uh, maybe have like a 2.5 or 3.0 GPA. Um, students need to be able to eat and not just in the dining hall, which is, you know, not always delicious. Uh, students need gas, uh, students wanna feel comfortable. And many times it's easier just to go back home and work. So I want to put it specifically at a financial perspective um, in this situation, because we talk about sense of belonging so much, and that's wonderful. Um, but if I got a full ride to a university and I got room and board paid, I would figure out a way to make it through. Um, but that financial component adds this really, really high level of, um, of stress to a number of students. And I would argue that, um, especially for lower income students, that affects them staying at an institution and being comfortable at that institution. I really appreciate that so much. I, I feel like uh, there's like this systems that we're engaging, that we're dealing with, that we're trying to adjust. And then there's these individual moments that people have on campuses. Um, and so when I'm, I'm thinking about engaging um, different research projects or programs or engaging in the classroom or just walking around a campus, I try to put a lens on of how easy is it for a person of a different set of intersectional identities to access this space. Um, so from little things, right? Like if the front door it has stairs up to it, that means that certain people who cannot use the stairs in that moment have to use a different door. Where is that door? Is that at the back of the building, right? How long does it take for people to get from one side of campus to the other, given particular abilities and disabilities? What does it mean when they have to walk through certain spaces if that's not a safe space for somebody of a particular racial identity or who are um, marked in particular ways? And what does that mean for how I set up my own classroom if it's 
you know, only a, a 10 minute passing period between classes and students have to get from one side of, you know, campus to the other or for one um, space around their job or their work or childcare and another. Um, and so really building in conversations with my students early on, um, with my colleagues early on of, you know, what's happening right before you're supposed to show up here into this space and what's happening right after and how can we build space into the structure of this, into the building, into the classroom that I pick, if I have a choice, um, into the ways that I've set up my desks and the, and those spaces. I'm asking those, those questions on like broad levels, system-wise levels, um, but also micro like interactive levels. Who's taking notes when there's small groups in my classroom and how can I encourage a broader uh, set of gender representation in the person taking notes in that small interaction, right? And so I think having an idea um, lens on at all times really should make us all um, really thoughtful and sensitive and, and aware of the ways that we can build universal design into all our practices so that it's not only about meeting particular individuals, but really everyone, regardless of their intersectional identities that they show up with um, and, and being thoughtful on the front side um, while responsive on the back side. There's some things that um, I, I talked about in when I was giving a, a talk in the idea pan an idea panel. Um, they really emerged from conversations with my students. They're, they're less obvious because people often don't come out as a, a, a working class or first generation. I, I, I know in my own experience. Um, when I was in college as a first generation student, I, I certainly didn't feel in, you know at all that like that was a that was a thing that we talked about um i felt quite a bit out of place but the research i was talking about at nca um what I, although we're making i i think some efforts to diversify our student bodies um the, there there's research you know harvard professor anthony abraham jack is talking about um there, there there's a lot of leaving students behind um with um, it, especially at elite universities. And what I, what I found in my own work with students at Villanova um, is that there's a lot of students who, who even, even if they do come from, um, if, even if they do come from like a, like a maybe more working class background, they attended schools that prepared them before they arrived. So they attended prep schools or expensive boarding schools and they had a clear sense how to navigate an environment such as Villanova. So he uses the word privileged poor in his work. He calls these students who come from maybe like a more low income neighborhood or a working class neighborhood and they maybe they receive a scholarship into a prep, prep school that prepared them and it becomes a pipeline into an elite college or university and so he he's done you know quite a bit of ethnographic work and the problem is that you know he found is that roughly 20 percent of economically disenfranchised um or working class students um were able to attend private school with a fraction of those students represented by people of color. So it, it suggests that how, you know, universities are pursuing diversity and who's being left behind. And, and he goes on to suggest that, um, that lower income black students and one third of lower income Latinx students at elite colleges actually graduate from boarding and day prep preparatory schools. So um, those, those, so that, that suggests a whole nother dynamic. So they, they're showing that, he's trying to show that there's a distorted recruiting lens and that the reality on the ground is that the schools start hedging their bets by undertaking methods that weaken their point of diversification. So what happens then to the, what, what he would call like the non-privileged poor and where do they where do they get educated? So he calls them the doubly disadvantaged, um, given that they are low income, but they attend um, economically disenfranchised uh, public schools and that they are getting um, left behind in the dialogue about identity and difference. 
And the question I ask is why do they need to present the cultural, social, and economic capital of private elite high schools to give them the opportunity of mobility? Yeah, I think what you're getting at is something that um, I, I've tried to argue for is, is a, a rationale for sort of shifting um, to what I'm trying to call the, an access paradigm for DEI issues. And the, the argument is basically this, that you can have diversity in a group in the sense of having a diverse group of people that's not accessible. And that group is still going to lack uh, is still going to have exclusion, right? That exclusion is the problem. And it's not that a group that is diverse necessarily doesn't exclude, or even a group that is inclusive. A group can be inclusive in some senses and still exclude. And so really the term that's essential to DEI for me is, is, is access, right? Because access is the choice to be included, not the, right, not, not being there. You can even be in a group that you don't even want to be part of and be providing some measure of diversity, right? I mean, that's the whole problem of tokenism. And so if we think about this in terms of what kinds of things do people need in order to have access to the institution and think about stuff like what Marnell's pointing out about all the financial inequities and the ways that that has an enormous impact on who not only has the opportunity to be there, but also develop a sense of belonging to think that they, you know, that to feel like they actually are engaged in the institution because they have the kinds of things that the people who are there who are privileged have that we then can start to think about, hey, it's not just a matter of what does the picture look like in terms of how much diversity do we see, but how accessible is the institution as a whole? And how do the various kinds of barriers that are created by things like financial inequities, right? By historical patterns of discrimination against people from particular racial backgrounds and whatever, all of those things are ultimately helping you know, create or, or extend uh, a, a series of practices of exclusion. And then that's really what the problem is. It's the exclusion that we should be trying to target, which means that the emphasis has to be on looking at these things through an access perspective. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that, that, you know, the, that diversity isn't, is, isn't desirable. I'm saying that you can look at a picture and say, oh, that must be a diverse group and not think about the ways that that's still being highly exclusive because people with certain ways of getting into that group aren't there. Yeah. Yeah, no, the students that I, I've, I, I've had students with many intersectional identities talk about, come to me to talk about their, their concerns about, you know, these very issues. And um, that's, that's, they're expressing the way, the way you summed it up is, is better probably than the way I summed it up. Okay, so I actually want to drill down a little bit on some of those issues. So there's research that suggests that individuals who grew up in low income or working class households change cultures as they change classes. So how can our campuses and classrooms support and recruit professors and staff from poor low income working class backgrounds who moved into the professional middle class as part of idea efforts? And how might having these professors and staff on campus um, create a richer environment for students? Yeah, that's that's tricky. I mean, there is um, NAPSA has a an organ um, a, a first generation initiative um, that I am aware of. I I I don't know how if they involve if that involves um, recruiting faculty, but it does have a whole it does have a a way to um, support and evaluate how how students are supported and programmatic elements um, with, with um, supported research. I'm not familiar um, with how it would work university-wide because I'm not in the administrative side of things. Um, but I think it's very hard. Um, there, there's a lot of kind of articles written about how coming out with your sort of identity in that regard might help students just kind of understand the biography of, of their professors. Um, and so that they, they can also relate to that. Um, I know that I, I've shared that with some of my students because there are students who actually don't have a car and go, go home on the train, which is you know, kind of a, sometimes unusual at my university. Um, 
And so they might travel like to, to New York and that's, that's, a little, that's a little tricky. Um, and, you know, some of these things are, are just th things to share maybe in your, in your biography, but, the, but some people don't wanna do that. I, and I can understand why. So I, I, I would actually, I would put this on an institute, on the, on the institution to create an environment that's accepting. And we're talking specifically about class. Um, so, so I wanna make sure we're not um, assuming that class relates to race and diversity of race. Um, I've gotta put that out there. Um, but I do wanna say from an institutional perspective, many times we um, claim that we want a diverse uh, group of faculty and staff, um, but we don't welcome them um, into the institution. And so I mean, welcome is in um, not like that first week, like, hey, how are you doing? And we're so glad you're here. But I mean, welcome them in terms of um, accepting their research, accepting their teaching styles, um, not expecting them to uh, conform to uh, uh, the same expectations that we do and, or, or completely assimilate into the culture of the university. Uh, many times we're only ac accepting of, of people who don't look like us or who are different until we're arguing with them in a faculty meeting, for example. And then it's like, mm, well, maybe you shouldn't get tenure or promotion because your student evaluations weren't so good because maybe the students weren't prepared for that type of um, a faculty member. Um, so as I think about um, what we can do to recruit, for me, I'm more so thinking about what we can do to keep faculty and staff who are of um, like a lower class or who represent a different demographic. And that means that the institution really has to work hard to make them accepted, um, and especially in terms of going up for tenure and or promotion, or if it's a part-time or adjunct faculty member, making sure they're paid. Um, and so I would take the um, expectation off that faculty member to put something about their class in you know, their letter or their resume um, and instead put it on the institution itself to make changes to be accepting toward that individual or toward that group of people. Arnell, I totally agree with that. I think there's something about the recruitment and the retention of faculty and staff, right, to ensure that um, when we're talking about spaces of belonging, it's not just good feelings or even goodwill, but yeah. that there's actually cohorts of mentoring practices of understanding that even as we learn the culture of the academy of, of whatever institution that you're at, um, people are slicing and dicing between, you know, what is this culture? Do I want to be a part of this culture? How can I bring my own cultural backgrounds, my own ways of knowing into this space? And I think as people in higher ed, as people who are really pursuing knowledge um, and, and diverse ways of knowing, it would be a huge mistake to think that when we're talking about class, um, diverse ways of knowing don't exist or aren't performed or aren't um, provided in different ways from different classes. And I think creating a space in which that's not something that must change, right? That it must, you must assimilate with this other structure, but rather really truly valuing that those distinct, unique, beautiful, amazing ways of knowing and incorporating them into what we're doing in the academy is crucial to the whole conversation moving forward. And I, I would also say even how we talk about um, class really informally, I remember like moving to or getting ready to move to a new city and the faculty would say things like, no, you definitely don't want to live over there like well why not like that's where the black people live i know where i don't want to live um and 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 the other hand sometimes um like when thinking about uh class issues of class you know we'll try to really say okay well i can find you a hairdresser for me specifically and they'll say things that aren't as important to me um where instead i want to make know that i'm being paid the same as my other faculty members i talk about pay and salary and scholarships a lot um, or even more um, i want to make sure i live in a place that feels comfortable to me not necessarily that's comfortable to you know the chair of the department um, so even as we talk about um, lower income how we frame it in like this way that's disgusting or negative is in, and especially informally is not a way that as I would say, feels good to me or sits right to me. And as we're welcoming new faculty and staff, 
Um, and as we're talking about places to live or giving them recommendations, it's gonna be important to take all those things into consideration. Yeah, um, Lakesha, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. I, 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 have a, I have a little bit of a speech problem. So sometimes I, I, I've, I've messed up. Did I pronounce your name right? It's Lakesha, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. okay, so um, to, to your point though, like what, and, and building on what they said, um, the, the, the culture, the cultural issue that Lubrano calls that straddling. And so he, people have, um, in, in, people often have, feel like they are in, in two different places and they, they then often, they, they'll feel like they are not in, like they, they don't relate to their, the people in their own class and they don't relate in the, in the new place. And I think that's what Marnell is trying to say. Um, that the people are off, maybe they're really, they're telling you uh, to go to a place where maybe that you, that you might find fine. Um, I, f I find that as well in some of the advice that people give me, um, that people are recommending places and I'm, I might be fine for, uh, fine with it, um, with, a, with class. Okay, I want to turn specifically to another issue and that's um, the issue of access for just a moment. Um, there are campuses that still lack full ADA compliance. Um, so how do we work to promote dialogue about issues of access on campus and advocate for the needs of students who experience access challenges? I'm well, lowering I, my I, hand because I know Jim is getting ready to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I. Uh, um, yeah, I wanted to start by suggesting that I, there, there may be uh, institutions which are technically in full compliance in some way, shape, or form, but there aren't any fully accessible campuses anywhere in the United States. And, and so it's not just a matter of um, some places where there needs to be more work done for access. It's, it's, it's across the board. Um, some are certainly better than others. And, uh, and a lot of institutions have done some really good work with places like you know, diversity uh, resource centers and things like that that are providing accommodations for people. But still, there is an awful lot of work that needs to be done with regard to um, addressing access issues. And I think that the short answer to, you know, to all of this is awareness. I mean, this is really what is needed around a lot of different types of access concerns is just people being aware of what the problem is. Um, and that's becoming increasingly clear with things like the, the work that we're doing now in neurodiversity and, and engaging the, uh, uh, you know, the access needs of a population that is neurodivergent is that a lot of times there, people just aren't aware of what the problem is and what the thing is that's being done. And so it's happening because it has institutional momentum and it's just going along without anyone even raising any questions. And it, uh, the way to change that is to get people thinking about it, right? And, and that takes a lot of, of, um, a lot of organizing sometimes. We've just started a, a neurodiversity alliance here at UNR, which is working to bring together st faculty, staff, and students who have interests around questions of neurodiversity. And, and we're not just neurodivergent people either. The group it ha that has developed has people who are neurotypical in it, which makes sense because neurodiversity isn't just neurodivergence, it's, it's also neurotypical, right? It's, it's both of those things combined. And the kinds of things that can be pointed out when that group gets together and says, hey, you know, here's something that bothers me. And other people go, well, yeah, you know, that's a problem for me as well. And someone else says, well, exactly. And, and I didn't know anyone else even thought that that was an issue. And then we find out that there's this very, you know, sort of systemic thing that is a concern or a problem for a lot of people that needs to be addressed. And um, that can be dealt with relatively easily once people start to think about it or look at it, right? Um, case in point is the, you know, the captioning, for instance, the transcript, right, the CC. It, it's somebody points out, hey, you know, it'd be a lot easier if you just turn that thing on and you're in enough Zoom sessions where someone says, hey, why don't you turn that on? All of a sudden it's, oh yeah, sure, no problem. But that's beneficial for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. And so the, you know, just the awareness of even those small micro things can be pretty significant because it allows you to make changes um, to, to, you know, that do benefit a lot of people. Um, but also I think that kind of awareness rec helps you recognize that a lot of the things that we have to address with regard to access are things that we're just not thinking about, right? 
Um, and, and that simply turning that little thing on so that we can see the closed caption didn't just solve the entire problem of the ways that you know we we tend to um, we tend to use you know, the oral uh, uh, discourse as a way of excluding some types of people intentionally or not. I might add even um, along with that awareness piece, which is again, just like always having this idea lens on, like you never take it off, right? Like who is here, who is not, who is speaking, who is silent, right? That kind of, um, it's never not in the conversation. It's always being performed in the conversation. It's always being manifested in the conversation. Um, something I've been thinking a lot about um, related to access, related to disability is how to kind of rewire the stigma that is just so rampant in higher ed. Um, there's a lot of conversations about how do we accommodate students? How do we make this a space where all are welcome and have access? I think those conversations around staff and faculty are actually much less frequent. I think when you apply for a position, oftentimes there's still a binary category of are you disabled, yes or no, something that would never fly anymore when we're talking about gender fluidity, about um, multiracial identities or mixed race identities um, around a, a whole bunch of different identities. There's a, a consciousness and an awareness around the fluidity of those pieces. And I think that conversation deserves to be looked at in our institutions and it the stigma around that do i mark yes or no also needs to be discussed when we're talking about employment recruitment and retention of our faculty and staff what elizabeth is pointing out is so important i think and <clears throat> i think the pandemic really put this under the microscope even more um some th there's many people who needed even more, I think, support staff and faculty through the pandemic um, because of illnesses sustained through the pandemic. Um, and I, 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 I think that they, not everyone was getting it across institutions. Um, and that's a conversation I think that a higher education needs to have. Um, there's a lot of groups including in communication online that, that I've seen people write things that I just can't believe are going on in institutions that, we, that needs to be, I think, addressed for, um, for, you know, I, for compliance to happen. Arnell, did you wanna jump in on this? No, I, well, yes, always. Um, I'm just going to keep it short. I just want to, um, one, one thing that Jim said that um, I always like to push for is uh, when someone who is not necessarily um, part of the group advocates for that group. Um, sometimes we put the, the ownership on making the change on whatever that group is. So whether mm -hmm. the person has a disability or is uh, um, traditionally a marginalized group, we expect them to be the person or persons or group to solve the problem for us. Um, and I would instead um, really push Elizabeth's perspective in terms of that idea lens is permanent. Like we've got to always be thinking about um, like who does not have access and, and also understand that, that it definitely is fluid because you know some people are uh, have a disability just for a short period of time and others it may be permanent and others, you know, we may never know, we don't need to, um, but we need to be able to make sure that they are, um, have the access to our universities in the same way um, that the students who um, are far more traditional have access. And Jim, you started to say something just a moment ago. So I wanted to give you that space to, to bring that back. Um, I don't want, I know, I was Melissa's point about the, uh, the the pandemic, I think, is worth noting. I, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, about how the pandemic has made people more aware of the, you know, their own uh, physical status and their ability to access certain spaces. Um, but one of the things that I think that it uh, that I noticed about it that I think a lot of people didn't, at least around me, um, that relates to what Marnell was talking about earlier with regard to financial status was the way that the digital divide started to show up. 
um, because I had students who were, you know, who were at home, uh, but where they were, they didn't have access to Wi-Fi. And so they were doing things like going into a public library in order to access classes that were being taught online, right? Um, and other people who didn't even have the ability really to do that because the public library was, was 45 miles away from where they lived and so on. Um, and so I think that the, the pandemic has brought a lot of things into view, um, and, uh, but that, you know, like, you know, keeping the, the, the lens on all the time, I think is important because I think some people looked at this and said, hey, this technology is really accessible. We're giving all kinds of people access. And, and in many ways, you know, we are, but we're also, we've got to be aware of the ways that some people don't have access to the same kinds of technology um, and don't have access to the same kinds of, of means. And making something accessible is, is a whole institutional change. And that's, that's why we have to keep doing what Marnell's saying and it cannot take it off. Um, and it can't just be about what's good for, you know, having everybody speak up themselves and say, here's what I need. It has to be a rethinking of what we're doing. Can I add one more uh, piece on to this? Um, I think it's been said in a number of ways um, over the last few minutes, but there are there are communication strategies that we use sometimes to try to build belonging or to build inclusion that are actually very exclusionary. So I was thinking recently in the last few weeks around the issue of the pandemic, how many times I've heard people say, oh, it's so good to see your face again. Mm -hmm. um, well, what does that mean for people who actually need to wear a mask? Mm -hmm. right? And what are you communicating through the very act of like, I'm happy to see you um, to anybody else that's in the room, right? Mm -hmm. Or the slight edge around like, oh, we have to be on Zoom or, oh, we have to do this, can simultaneously send a message for the people who that's actually the best form of communication for them, that it's mm -hmm. subpar, that it's not up to the norm, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of reinforcing this ableism that is so prevalent in society. So I think it's, I'm not perfect, but there is that sense of like stepping back and saying, even in my best intent, who am I excluding by the messages that I'm sending? Well, we are almost out of time. So we're going to have one more question and it's going to stem from something you talked about um, Marnell at the beginning, which is that idea work isn't just one unit or one space on campus, but it, it needs to be everywhere. So um, my final question is what suggestions do each of you have for strategies to incorporate idea work through all units on college campuses? Well, I'll jump in. I, I think that the, the focusing on the kinds of things that we've been pointing out, right? How ways to, to generate awareness of, of identifying and, and addressing various different kinds of uh, uh, barriers that are causing inaccessibility, thinking of this as a systemic kind of issue rather than as some little piecemeal things that the, all of that says that we really do need to be thinking in terms of for lack of a better word, a, a kind of global approach where we are saying, this isn't just a matter of we're gonna solve privilege by doing this one thing or just changing that. It really does require that you think about DEI and IDEA as an ongoing process that's never going to be done. It's never going to be finished in the sense that we'll never, I think, reach a point at which we can go, you know what, there's nothing better we can do to make this a better institution, right? I mean, it doesn't even, Right. It doesn't even really make sense, right? We were going to be adapting to and dealing with all sorts of even unknown issues in the future. And thinking about this as something that's an ongoing process where we establish permanent institutions or permanent parts of our institutions that are constantly doing this sort of thing, rather than something that might say, you know, here's something that is just going to go away, right? Institutions have development branches where they say, okay, we are involved in the process of raising money so that the institution can continue to develop facilities and build buildings and so forth. And that's a big important part of what we do. We're just starting to get to the point where we're putting in, uh, where we're recognizing that IDEA work is, is just as essential to the institution. And that I think is something that we need to keep pushing for. Um, there, I mean, you know, the development officer should be as the person who does whatever the IDEA work is, whose job it is to sort of oversee that and be in a position where they're going to continually foster that, they can't be the only person doing the work, obviously. But that person should be at least as high status as whoever it is that's that's raising funding for new buildings. And in a lot of cases, that's places that's not the case, right? That's just not the way the status is accorded. 
I, I agree with Jim and um, that it should be a global approach. And I would go back to what I said at the be the beginning. I I think that every place probably has different strengths. Um, and so I I like the idea of having um, internally facing research units that um, that can allow the the college or university to reflect on where those might be um, in the in the university so they could have um, knowledge of what kind of programs could work and they could work kind of separately and inform that um, that person that office who is who is the like the DEA provost or dean um, to impart new ideas through through the college or university so um, and, and most colleges and universities have great faculty, um, ethnographers, social science faculty who work on these issues, who might be able to, might be interested in working on some of these issues. So I think those might be some, some areas to work on. My instinct too is kind of building off of Jim's sense of like, it's always going, right? And, and, and Melissa is saying also, you know, this is a global approach. Um, to, I think humility is really important across units and all across campuses of the sense of like, we're not there yet. That doesn't mean we haven't done good work. And it doesn't mean that if we point out what we still need to work on, that that's wrong, it's actually good. And so really adopting the sense of humility of and inviting people to say where you're wrong, um, where things are getting missed and instead of, um, kind of this competitive edge of like everything must be perfect, right? And this drive in the academy toward a per certain meaning or understanding of what perfection is, that perfection gets slightly redefined as growth, as learning, as humility, as really um, inviting that space. And the other thing, other thing I would say here um, on on the constant invitation to get involved with the NCA strategic plan is to incorporate ideas into the strategic plan always. So that anytime money is allocated, anytime awards are allocated, anytime like you know different initiatives are underway, they're always tied into a much larger constant lens of idea within the strategic plan. And I think that helps bring our units together in a different way. So that it's not just um, individual acts, but it's a collective movement that has this kind of built-in accountability. Arnell, do you want to wrap it up for us? Sure. Uh, you know, I'm looking at it from like a, an organizational perspective. Um, so I, the first thing I would challenge us to do is look and see where um, the DI person or office is on our campuses. Um, is it like a small office in academic affairs? Um, look at the reporting structure. Who does the person report to? Do they have a staff? Um, look at... Uh, um, what types of problems that they solve? Like, are they really like HR? So you send issues that relate to students of color to that person or relate to faculty of color to that person. And I would actually argue that if you want um, the structure of the university to change, those systemic structures happen at the top. Uh, and so if the university or institution is really um, dedicated to making change, then they need to hire somebody um, and not just somebody who reports to a dean because then it's going to be within academic affairs and it's not going to be, you know, they have no say in financial aid or, or you know, admissions, um, but hire somebody who's a VP who reports straight to the president and whose peers are the provost and the other VPs. And that person then will have the power to like infiltrate and make change and, um, and kind of look at all those other units on campus and, uh, and, and really kind of address idea from a, um, a point of view and from a power, a place of power that will be able to reflect change. Um, essentially that person would be able to say, this is what you need to do and you're gonna do it. Um, and so that would be my argument and my suggestion. If that stuff is important, then it needs to hold an important place on campus. And that person should have a staff and, um, and be able to really um, address all the things that we talked about today. Absolutely. Right. So I know that we can probably talk about this for hours, but <laughs> I do need to be mindful of the time and the questions that are coming in. 
Um, so with those answers, we'll wrap up today's conversation and go into the question and answer portion of today's program. Um, for those of you with us on Zoom, feel free to send your questions to the chat and we'll get to as many of those as we can. We have 30 minutes, so we'll do our best. Um, so if you give me just a moment, I'll get our first question. We actually don't have one yet. So as soon as we have one, I will share that with you. And while we're waiting, I just want to mention that. Um, the oh, you're muted. Okay, so you're muted. <laughs> Oh, somebody muted me. Um, <laughs> while we're waiting on our first question, I just want to mention that the audience will also get, um, everyone who's here with us today will get a follow-up survey um, asking for feedback about today's program. So it'd be really helpful to us if you just took a few minutes, it will be very brief, three to four questions. If you could just uh, complete that and get it back to us, that would be really helpful. I know there have to be questions out there. So send those to your chat boxes. That's a gym question. Okay, so I will read this for everyone. Um, this question is, how do you think online activism has been helpful in creating more inclusion and accessibility in higher education institutions? Well, the, um, the I'm, not, I'm not, I don't wanna bracket online activism and make it into something that's not, uh, that, that's too limited. But one of the things that I think we've seen with the use of social media um, through things like the, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the communication scholars transformation and so forth that we've been able to to create a wider sort of recognition of the ways that these are systemic problems. Uh, we've opened up the door to conversations about things that are um, that that were sort of underneath the radar. Um, you you know these platforms allow us to circulate messages very quickly about things that are going on in our institutions and allows us to see that there are similar sorts of things happening elsewhere. And I think that that's, you know, in a sense, what we're doing is creating um, awareness of how these types of concerns, how problems of exclusion aren't just limited to certain institutions, but that they're found throughout them. And that some institutions are better than dealing with them than others, but that these problems are still pretty much everywhere. So at least that's one sense of what I think of when I, I hear the term online activism is to think about how we've been using things like Facebook and other kinds of social media in order to spread the word about things that are happening and, um, and create communities where we can have these kinds of conversations and suggest things that can be done and so forth. Great, we have a second question. Um, how do, Sorry, I'm having trouble reading. How can we most effectively advocate for inclusive strategies that include physical changes to buildings? For example, the things that Elizabeth was discussing earlier about building access. I can take it for stab, but I definitely welcome all of your expertise on this. Um, the first thing I think about is um, knocking down doors, uh, like use your voice, like get out there and talk to people at the institution who are in charge of these spaces, have financial um, investments in some of these spaces. If you're thinking about building new buildings, these should not be like secondary discussions. And so the more present these discussions are, all the time, the less likely a new building is going to be put in place that didn't think about these things from the beginning. Because at this point, I feel like, especially around new buildings, we shouldn't be having to retroactively fit um, these conversations into those builds. I think it gets harder when you're talking about older buildings on older institutions of how do you um, address the fact that you know stairs are in this space and the um, back door is there and who's going in that back door and how does that relate to race, to class, to some of those other things. Um, but I still think the conversations around building ramps to get up that front set of stairs um, and making that a priority rather than having to kind of constantly weather the conversation around aesthetics 
and aesthetics beating out accessibility um, is part of it is just kind of increasing the volume, increasing the presence of these conversations and um, building coalitions around it. That's some of my first thoughts. I'd like to add just also know um, basically the, the hierarchy in your university. So know when, for example, budgets for the next year are due. Um, deans and provosts submit their budgets, depending on the institution, uh, as early as December of the previous year for the next year. Um, it's very easy to say we don't have the money for it. Um, and, and we like to often hide behind we don't have the money. And it's often true. Um, but to speak to your chair or your dean or your provost, um, as well as facilities management about when this could happen, you let them know up until a year in advance. And that's still going to be a year too late. Um, but I would just think about that time frame. Um, and a lot of universities will do um, that type of significant work in the summer. So also think about um, think about that as you're like doing your planning. Like the change is not going to happen the next day, um, but with some persistence and just some knowledge of the timelines that the um, VPs and the other administrators have to abide by, that'll often help. I think it's worth noting too that there, are, and something I've been discovering really myself um, recent with the work that we've been doing on neurodiversity and issues on campus, is the ways that you can use small um, uh, small parts of the institution, like the newsletter. Right, we have our, our our college newsletter, we have our campus newsletters that are being you know, that are circulated on a, a weekly basis and so forth. And um, it meant a big, it made a big thing or had a big impact on the group that that I'm with now that's just being developed that one of the people that joined was somebody whose responsibility it was was he edits the, the campus newspaper, um, the online, you know, weekly. And, um, and so we've been regularly putting in, you know, little blog posts, 250 word piece, you know, that that identifies something or, you know, recognizes this is an issue or calls attention to that. And I think that that kind of little sort of work can be done in a lot of ways to help advocate for inclusive strategies because it helps paint that overall picture so that when somebody does see like you know like Elizabeth was saying and and you know they say okay let's do this new building there's this idea already in the back of people's minds that hey we need to make sure we address this and when people are talking about things like you know what goes into a budget or what should be there there's already a general sort of sense of okay this is something we need to be thinking about when we do that um, and that kind of work is, you know, it, it takes time. You've got it. Writing a 250, 350 word blog piece doesn't isn't quite just throw it off the cuff because you've got to take the time to do it well. And you've got to, but you get enough people doing that kind of thing. You keep putting that message out there over and over and over, even in the small ways. I think it helps give that overall, you know, reinforce that message on a larger scale. Gets the message out. Our next question is, how do you reconcile the balance of compliance with empathy? So Jim talked about awareness, but that awareness is individual and immeasurable in a way that could hinder advancing idea. I, I would take a stab at this question. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, in that so a lot of the things that we discussed here um, and the, the methods are, are great. And one, one of the many methods that we haven't um, maybe practiced or is, isn't practiced as much is again, the, the deploying research um, and, and kind of bridging it a little more with pra practice. Um, and so it's not, it's not unique to higher education that that isn't always done. Um, so I, I, I read, in, I think it was a study from the University of Massachusetts where they, where they, um, where they, they studied mentoring and they investigated how well faculty peer mentoring was going. Um, and they did a focus group with, with it and they found with gender and rank and they found that, um, that, the, that the males were getting so much more faculty peer mentoring than the females. Um, so if they hadn't done that, they wouldn't have been able to kind of tap into that. Um, now that's not maybe necessarily completely answering your question about compliance, but it does sort of get at like, you know, you could, you could find out sort of individual issues that are going on in the institution. Um, and they, and I believe they, they published that article. Um, the, what happened was the women didn't want to burden <laughs> other faculty with, um, 
with with assignments and 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 asking for help and advice. So that was what they found. And I guess that does sort of get to your question about like in some ways, maybe requesting empathy. Um, so um, you know, you might find these different dynamics un under the under the surface in different institutions playing out in different ways. Um, I, I think if you were to like do a little research. Okay, I'm going to move on to our next question, which is something I think we'll have lots of opinions. What are your feelings about admissions tests and ideas? So ACTs, GREs, things of that nature, which have drastically changed with COVID, right? So many yeah. students have yeah. not been to test optional. Um, <clears throat> how can you speak to that? You know, you know that's so interesting because it, that how quickly those things had changed when it wasn't convenient for for. Um, to have them that we didn't really need them. So um, I, I kind of have a, have a, you know, if, if, they are, if they are not as, if they weren't needed for COVID, I'm not really sure why they are needed at all. <laughs> but um, I, when, I, when I was highlighting Anthony Jack's book that here, um, a lot of the, it's, it's not coming in focus here, but those, I know that in, in the public school that I attended, that was not really emphasized, like the training and prepping for, um, for admissions tests. And I think that is something that is, tends to be more emphasized in, in maybe higher tax space schools or in um, private schools. So I think that, 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 that those tests don't necessarily get at what the, what the, what what someone's um, what what someone can do in college, or or what someone's ability can you know can can do. So I'm not necessarily a, you know pro admissions test, and um, I think that they that they were that that we we found out quickly with with COVID that they that they. Um, that, that we were able to negotiate them out of the system, you know, out when, when they weren't convenient. So that's kind of a, my, my sort of opinion on them, I guess. I just have a couple of quick thoughts. I think it's a super great question and a really complicated one. Um, one is that um, these tests and the preparation for them can be extremely expensive. So when we're talking about access into institutions, I think it's something we need to attend to, not so much about perhaps the test itself, but the process at which people are able to ex like access these tests, and then what we think these tests tell us in concert with the other types of application materials that are coming through the system. So it, on the financial side, I have some concerns. And then I have some concerns on the linguistic and the cultural side as well as somebody who, when I would take these tests, would often, um, as a native English speaker, but as somebody from a multiracial, multicultural background, wouldn't always know what they were referring to um, with the cultural examples. Um, I think they can reinforce particular types of marginalization around um, naming, around the context. Um, and so that maybe speaks more to the test itself that as people continue to refine these tests, if we continue to use them, that people also pay attention to the ways that it is excluding particular people from doing well on the tests because they don't have the linguistic and cultural knowledge to access them. Thinking about, you know, I've got a, a, a brother who writes you used to write for the SATs. So I'm always thinking about something from an organizational perspective, but the people who write SAT questions are human beings. Um, and these are people who have master's degrees. These are um, an ACT. Uh, and, and then these questions are vetted by folks who are even higher than them. And as we think about this, you can just imagine what a majority of the writers and those who vet these questions look like. And then you think about the people who are taking the tests and what they look like. Um, I, I mentioned um, earlier in, um, in this session that uh, every, there's not one class where race, gender, any kind of diversity should not be overt. 
And so I distinctly remember my statistics class at Howard University, and we talked about how these tests, especially um, SATs um, specifically, are skewed and how for Black people, um, we fare worse on them um, because of language, culture, because of who's writing the test, because of who's grading the test. Um, and so there's definitely evidence, not just anecdotally, but um, in terms of research, as Melissa mentioned, that show that the tests are not objective and they're not equal for, for every single student. Um, so as we think about, and I mentioned this earlier, scholarships, as we think about admission standards, we've got to be able to um, add some items in there to measure or to determine who should be admitted and who should get scholarships beyond tests beyond um, GPA, because if not, we'll have the same types of students who continue to thrive at the university as we did 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. Jim, did you want to address that at all or do you just wanna stay away from that topic? <laughs> oh, no, I, I don't wanna stay away from it. I think that, um, but I think the important things have been said. The, you know, standardized tests are going to give you the same kinds of answers that they have before because they're going to replicate the systems that put them in place. And that's not the best way to figure out how to challenge an exclusive system because all you're going to do is keep making it more exclusive, right? Um, I mean, I agree entirely with Marnell saying 100%. Right. So let's move on to our next question. Do you think that shifting our focus to community building in our classrooms and departments can help foster a better sense of inclusion? I think this gets at the part of the question that um, Tamara had asked earlier that we didn't get too much, but which was about the problem of awareness being something individual. I think community building is how you get it from awareness from being something that is just an individual phenomenon into something that is a generalized sense of the awareness of a community, somebody that's focused on a thing, right, or an overall problem or, or an overall issue. And so, yeah, I think community building is particularly important. Um, and and Again, I've been talking a lot about the neurodiversity work that I've been doing, but it's what I've been doing lately, so it's what's on my mind. The When we put together the alliance here at UNR, um, we, ex, we very deliberately made uh, it an organization that brings together faculty, staff, and students, because those are typically three completely different in, you know, groups that in a college or university, right? They're often treated separately. They have different kinds of access to different types of resources. And that was, we started to look around and said, you know, we've got all kinds of weird overlaps and also huge gaps because there's counseling services that are available for students and faculty, but not for staff, right? What's the logic here, right? And, and it's just because the way that those things have been separated out, developing a community allowed us, or is allowing us, it's really just getting started to say, okay, here's something that affects me, but there's a solution over there that I don't have a way to get at. Can we do something about that? And so bringing people together into this group that says, we're going to sort of recognize this as part of what we're doing. We're going to be allied around issues of neurodiversity and we're gonna talk about these things and bring our concerns to this group. Building that community is, is I think having a significant impact on how we're able to sort of see what kinds of things can be done and what problems there are. So I, I personally think that it can work. That isn't maybe the only way to operate, but it's working well for us. I, I want to say on paper, building community looks great. Mm -hmm. um, in reality, um, for a lot of um, like historically marginalized groups, it's work mm -hmm. um, because that's when you want me to talk about, I don't know, my parents, where they're from or talk about, you know, woe is me, or I'm expected, I'm saying I, because, you know, I'm just using myself as an example to teach, or, or, or um, I still have to put on like that facade. So I can't completely be me. And so as we talk about building community, what does that mean? Like, do you expect us to all like hold hands? Um, is it after hours? Because at that point in time for students or for faculty, it still feels like work. Um, I'm not going to sit and relax and just, you know, be who I am around my friends. So now you're essentially asking me to work another two hours while we have dinner and I just can't wait to go home for the sake of community. Um, if it's in the classroom um, with students, then that's already in the space that's basically dedicated for learning. And so that's safer because you've got to be here anyway. Or if it's for faculty, if it's during, you know, hours where you're already on campus. But as you talk about building community, who wants to build it? Are the people who are historically marginalized, do they want to be there? Um, would I rather be at work or 
you know, watching Hulu or, or whatever it is. Um, and so we've got to really think about like the idea of community is, is awesome. Um, and the, the results of community are even um, far, far reaching across the university. Um, but on whose back are we building community? Who's doing the work? Who's working after hours? Um, and I'm saying this from experience, um, mm -hmm. you know, oh, hey, let's all go to dinner after work. You know, like that's that's an extension of my work day. That's that's what's happening. So I would like us to kind of think about like it sounds nice on paper, but what does it actually mean for, for those involved? I really appreciate that because I, I also love community, <laughs> like love the concept of community, love being in community, love inviting people into community, um, but community in and of itself has boundaries. And once we have boundaries, then we need to ask the question, who's included and who's excluded in the community, right? By the nature of the term community and how it functions, um, we're right back to idea again mm -hmm. of how is that constructed? Who did the calling? Who decided to um, be gatekeepers of like what this community is gonna look like? Um, and that's, that's straight back to those policies and those procedures and those practices that we're getting at here of like, this is a global thing. This is a holistic thing we got to get at. Um, the other thing that despite my constant call and urge for community that I'm concerned about sometimes is um, what it means in our workplaces when we use particular types of metaphors or images like family or community, what does it mean for doing work that makes people uncomfortable? for doing the work that calls people out or calls people into a conversation that is hard. Um, what happens when words like, you know, friends or those types of things, which are beautiful in and of themselves, become part of a larger discourse in institutions of how we do and don't show up, especially when we're trying to do um, equity work, when we're trying to do justice work, when we're trying to make movements to access. And so at my heart, I love it. Um, but then in the back of my head, I'm like, ooh, this can go sideways. And I've seen it go sideways and I've experienced it going sideways pretty fast. And so would want to be careful, I guess, in how we use those metaphors. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question and we have just one more. Um, I'm, it's a little, there's prefacing to this question. So I'm gonna read it to you the way that, that the way that the writer has given it to us. On the topic of creating community on campus, I find that there is a lot of self-selection in the folks who attend idea events and professional development. While these are great opportunities to learn more, there is an element of preaching to the choir or the emotional labor that Marnell is referring to. How can we get the people who most need the awareness to participate? Sorry, I thought Melissa was going to say something, so I, I was holding off. Um, the uh, this is this is uh, yeah, this is a really big problem, right? And and this is um, and this is part of why I think it's really helpful for if you can get faculty who are tenured, right, to be the faculty who are involved instead of just the you know the new assistant professor who's trying to get into uh, uh, you know to, to get established and and to maintain the the you know, their status at the community. And, and it is a, it, I mean, there isn't a real simple answer to that question because there's probably lots of different things that you can do and they are all contextual and dependent on the situation and so forth. But I think in general, the thing that you need to do is figure out ways that you can um, tap into the existing structures it meant a lot for the work that we're doing that we were able to get identified as a presidential initiative. So the president of the university, right, comes to our kickoff event and things like that. Um, it, it's very important to be aware of things like Marnell was saying with budgets and the way the money works and things like that, because getting into and having access to those sorts of things and what's happening on them, just being able to read a budget and read what a balance sheet looks like and lets you know where the priorities and stuff are being placed. Um, is how you can start to get at some of the more ingrained institutional parts. Because otherwise, yeah, it is just sort of, it's just gonna be the people who got together because they feel strongly enough about it that they're gonna do something about it. And then there, there's a tendency for the institution, I think, to even just sort of go, oh good, problem solved and, and let's go on over here. Um, it, that can't be what happens, but there's also not a simple answer. Oh, here, here's all you have to do. If, if there was, we'd be doing it. But instead um, it takes, supporting each other. It takes recognizing that 
want to be burdening some people with work that everybody should be doing. It takes um, people who have the resources being able to use them and being willing to put them forward like that. And it takes generally recognizing, I think, that this is an ongoing process that's not just going to get done. Right. That that's it seems like that's a simple thing, but it, it really isn't. It's a complex kind of turn to say, OK, this isn't just something I'm going to make go away. Let's rethink what we're doing. I want to I want to add to that. Um, I want to focus in on a term that Brooke used, emotional labor. Mm. And uh, that uh, Bern Marnell was alluding to uh, that she pointed out as well um, that it, I, I suppose that if if this is indeed that kind of work, that it sounds to me that it should be compensated. And I don't know if institutions do this, as I'm, I'm, I'm probably the most junior person here, um, that that would be everyone, including the people that are, she uses the term preaching to the choir, the people who are in the choir, maybe, and, and the people who are maybe not in the choir, that might be a way to, I'm not sure, get them involved more um, because, you know, you know, you could ask them and then if there is a, a way to get them to commit, um, you know, you know, and then compensate them in different ways, um, because everyone's got, you know, in some ways, or they a, a busy schedule and, 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 and they, they want to be supported. And if, if, if not, um, you know, um, obviously there, there's, the, there's the recognition aspect of the compensation, but, um, you know that that might be there 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 might be a way to monetarily compensate them i'm not sure what the institutions can possibly do but um jim was talking about budgets and so on so it made me sort of think of that <laughs> two two quick things i think what everybody's saying is great um my first I, I, I feel like I'm a little cynical today. I'm um, like, do we want people who aren't wanting to build awareness to participate? Um, what does that mean? What does that look like? How do we advance idea initiatives with that component in place, right? And so I'm kind of asking myself, who should be in the room? Who should be at the table? And whose voices do we really want to advance? And that doesn't mean I don't want everybody at the table, but in some ways it does. It means that I want the voices and the, the energy and the power at the table that will move idea forward. Um, so we want everyone to participate, we, but we don't want them just to participate. We want them to join the movement forward, right? And so kind of thinking through what does that look like is, is something I'm uh, reflecting on with that question. Um, the other thing I would say is, I think how we get people to participate is to change what the rewards, as Melissa was saying, and the penalties for not participating. And so these are policy things. And so I would just maybe underscore, uh, it's really time to move people, um, move yourself into those positions in which you can create these policies and procedures that reward, and then perhaps penalize people who do not engage and do not promote idea initiatives. Okay, well, with that, we will conclude today's public program. Thank you to the panelists who joined us for a great conversation and really helpful insights. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Have a great week.